Welcome to today's U.S.-China Institute webinar, where we're really delighted to have with us Professor Nick Kolb uh, from the USC Annenberg School for Journalism, uh, for Communication and Journalism. Today, we of course are in the middle of this COVID-19 crisis. Uh, it, it originates in December and January, as you know, it breaks out in China, nearly 5,000 people perish in China as a consequence of the disease. But today, of course, it's a global pandemic. We have more than 6 million confirmed cases, 350,000 deaths globally. Damn, this is just a catastrophe. More than 100,000 deaths in the United States. And if yesterday is repeated today, we're going to have 85,000 new cases today. Well, our focus today is on leadership and reputation. How countries are coping and how that coping effort is perceived by others. Now, evaluations of a, a country's competency, a country's leadership, you know, there are a lot of different factors. Uh, same thing, of course, with reputation. Evaluations are tied to many different things. Uh, of course, pre-existing knowledge and perceptions, but then secondarily, performance, competence. How well do you cope with crisis? And of course, that process is influenced by degrees of openness, sources of information, things like that. Of course, a third big issue, and one that uh, Professor Cole will be talking about at some length today, is how a story is told. What gets emphasized? Who tells a story? How do they present the story? How credible is their version of events? Now, I really want to uh, you know, have you pay particular attention to Professor Cole's emphasis on collaboration and cooperation and the strength, the reputational strength, the credibility that can come from that. He also talks about the importance of gifts, the function of gifts, this kind of thing. It's a really outstanding, outstanding presentation. Now, uh, Nick, would you wave it at everybody, please? We're glad you're here, and I'm gonna brag a little bit about you. Uh, you, of course, come to us from Britain. Uh, you studied at the University of Leeds, you taught, at Birmingham University, the University of Leicester, uh, created a Center for American Studies. You're a specialist on stories Americans tell about themselves and how they're perceived in these different places. But you've been at USC now for a decade and a half. Uh, you helped to create the program on public diplomacy, the master's degree program. And you, of course, are a leading media historian and a true pioneer in the field of public diplomacy. I'm telling you things, of course, that you have done, but I'm speaking to our audience here about the many publications uh, that Professor Cull has produced. His most recent work is uh, co-editing the Rutledge Handbook of Public Diplomacy, uh, and he is uniquely qualified to do this. He is quite literally uh, the co-editor of an encyclopedia on what? Propaganda and mass persuasion one of these different areas that we'll be looking at. But he's written extensively. He's the co-author of a couple of interesting books on cinema, looking at science fiction, and also looking at representations of empire. But many people in this field first came to know him for this fantastic prize-winning book on the Cold War and the United States Information Agency. American Propaganda and Public Diplomacy, looking at the period from 1945 to 1989. We are so fortunate to have with us Professor Nick Cole today. Uh, like uh, the media here in the United States, but worldwide, we turn to him when we want to talk about messaging and public diplomacy. And so why don't we do that? Let's turn to Professor Nick Cole now for his presentation. It lasts about 35, 36 minutes, and then we're going to go to questions. So please remember, if you have a question, if you want to raise uh, an issue, please click on that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen 
and submit your question. We want you to be a part of this discussion. Thanks for being with us. Good afternoon. What I want to talk about today is the way in which our current crisis around the coronavirus is impacting on ideas of leadership and reputation in the international sphere. I'll begin by talking about the moment that we were already in, in terms of the landscape of communication and reputation. And then I want to unpack some of the behaviors that I think we can see uh, already um, uh, forming in uh, nation states uh, in their uh, approach to global leadership and communication. I've identified four strategies of virus diplomacy, and I'll look at each of those in turn. I'm going to make some predictions for how I see the uh, reputations of the great powers changing as a result of this crisis. And I have one overarching theme that I hope comes through my remarks, and that's that in the world of pandemics, a nation state can't go alone. Now, I already thought that it was one of the conclusions of my recent book, Public Diplomacy, Foundations for Global Engagement in the Digital Age, but I feel that the, um, the virus has, under, has underlined that, um, that conclusion and that um, going forward, the ability of a nation state, the ability of a great power to collaborate with others will become one of the defining characteristics of its, of its reputation. And the uh, final uh, conclusion that I'm going to make is that in a virus, the personal is p political and the ability of citizens to contribute to a positive image of the country uh, will also be critical. Uh, I am going to focus particularly on the view from the United States and how it relates to uh, the policies and image of a People's Republic of China. So first of all, our moment in brief. Well, the British analyst Simon Anholt is fond of remarking that there is only one superpower left. And at the moment that he starts to see the Americans kind of swelling up with pride, he has to cut them off and say, but that superpower is public opinion. And the way in which public opinion has moved to the fore of international relations is one of the defining characteristics of our moment. We know public opinion is uh, important. Uh, that's why right now uh, international actors are appealing to public opinion so much, and we see it uh, becoming so divided and confused. It's because it's powerful that attention is being paid to it. Publics are now central to the foreign policy process. But to make matters more complicated, our moment is also a moment of technological transition. We're moving from the first generation of internet and uh, online uh, diplomatic tools to a new world in which social media is uh, the cornerstone and in which information is passed from person to person to person horizontally. And whenever there's a new technology uh, in the, the political realm, uh, we've, we find a level of instability coming with that because people, they don't have the same uh, defenses uh, to uh, misinformation uh, that they uh, have with media that they've been used to for, uh, for many, many years. And uh, this is actually something of a pattern you can see throughout the 20th century, whenever a new technology came along that we saw, uh, we saw it linked to instability. Uh, especially if it was accompanied by uh, economic uh, dislocation. Our world was already unstable, and the uh, confusion around misinformation, disinformation, social media, um, and, um, the, and, and these new technologies is not uh, helping. 
states are already losing credibility um, and they're spending, um, many states are spending less uh, on uh, the business of explaining themselves and reaching out to others. What we're seeing is uh, that politics in many places is emphasizing uh, single strong leaders, the strong men, and is uh, finding stability uh, by looking to the past and often uh, a romantic or exaggerated idea of a past. There are many countries in the world where leaders are talking about uh, making the country great again, uh, taking back control, uh, rebuilding uh, a, a reputation that was uh, lost. We are seeing a world in which the media has been weaponized um, and the problem of that weaponized media is that the reputation of a nation state is now a, a contested element in that country. It, um, just a few years ago when we talked about soft power, it was spoken of as being this bonus thing that the wealthiest states could uh, develop or um, uh, cultivate. Uh, now I think it, it, it's different. Uh, you won't just, uh, your reputation is not just for the wealthiest state, uh, it's for the, the most vulnerable states find that if they don't have a reputation, really nasty things can happen to them. And everybody is aware that their reputation can be attacked from outside or from uh, from uh, hostile uh, adversaries. So reputations are um, part of security and uh, nations need to consider the best way of protecting their reputation uh, in the same way that they would protect any other national asset through uh, economic or through military policy. So as we go into a confrontation for uh, reputation coming out of the, the uh, virus, we have a um, uh, what, what a military historian would call the order of battle, the status of the significant players going into this crisis. Well, in the first instance, you have the United States. The country uh, is right now uh, politically divided. It's led by a uh, leader who is, uh, shall we say, eccentric and divisive, both at home and uh, abroad. On the other side of the Pacific, we have China, uh, where uh, the President Xi is uh, tightening control, um, focusing power on himself, uh, and is reaching out, sensitive to world opinion, eager to cultivate the admiration of the world and uh, like his predecessor um, presenting evidence of the admiration of the world as a form of legitimacy for his rule saying look this is something that i can deliver to you uh, the admiration of the world where once china was dismissed now it's admired see how the world looks to beijing and and, and so forth in the European Union, uh, we have an uh, ongoing crisis. Um, the Union was, uh, at the time the virus uh, broke out, uh, already underperforming in a number of key areas and certainly strained by the migration crisis. Uh, there were questions over what the future of the European Union would be and how best to go forward. The most spectacular of these being uh, questions uh, arising from the departure of Britain from the European Union through Brexit. Uh, Russia um, is still a major factor in world affairs, but plays a kind of a spoiling role. Uh, that is, they um, feel they have no stake in the status quo, and so seek advantage by um, disrupting uh, 
arguing that no alliances are genuine, that all states are corrupt, all leaders are just trying to get advantage, and uh, causing um, confusion in international media space, uh, really as, as, a, as a, a policy. When we come to the actual virus, the nation states have followed uh, certain strategies uh, explaining themselves to the world. And the first has been to emphasize success in their own uh, approaches, publicizing successes at home. And this means sharing uh, stories about heroic doctors and uh, nurses. The person in, in, in the photograph is actually an American doctor uh, photographed in, in, in New York. Uh, uh, second tier of stories are about how resilient the public has been, how they're coming up with great ways of uh, entertaining themselves, supporting each other, uh, and so forth, and how wise uh, governments have been in devising uh, their, their policies. Um, uh, there's an interesting phenomenon that um, very often now, because foreign and domestic media get mixed up and a domestic news source is available internationally and vice versa. Uh, we are seeing stories intended for home audiences being shared internationally and uh, the other way around too. Uh, we're also seeing um, that the way in which um, nation, uh, in which commercial media uh, talk about events in a country uh, can be um, uh, misunderstood as being a government interpretation of that country. So it's, it's kind of uh, um, confusing uh, some diplomatic communication. I think that the United States is at something of a disadvantage uh, when it talks about itself and its success. And that's because the world is so familiar with American popular culture. And one of the subgenres of American popular culture is what TV critics call competence porn. And what they mean by competence porn are television programs where why you watch it is to watch super capable, super competent people doing their job. And uh, this is the way in which American medical shows work. Uh, it's the way in which shows about American government like uh, West Wing have uh, worked. And so the, the world, um, whether or not it's reality or not, has an expectation of American efficiency and technology. And this means that um, uh, difficulties in uh, American um, behavior, in difficulties in American administration and healthcare uh, are more surprising to outsiders and do more of a damage to um, uh, the American uh, image than uh, they would for, for other countries. Um, one of the problems that we've seen with messaging that emphasizes the success of the self is that some countries have jumped into boasting about their success and their competence, but then have found that um, events surprised them. Uh, this was particularly a problem for, uh, for Japan. They were seeking to build up uh, or reassure world audiences at an early stage um, I think so they could uh, keep the Olympics on schedule and then uh, lost control of the a virus and damaged, uh, I think, the national image with, with fumbling uh, messaging over that. One of, the interesting, one of the interesting things we can see about how messages and reputations are projected during this crisis is that it's possible for stories to split. By this, I mean that it's clearly possible for a people to be shown and perceived around the world as being good and responding well to the virus, whilst a leader or leadership uh, can be seen as uh, mistaken, weak, or um, making um, mistakes. The same thing can be applied to um, the um, uh, 
uh, to uh, uh, regional governments. You can see good regions that are coping uh, and bad uh, nations where um, uh, bad decisions are being made at, at the top level. And I think audiences around the world are quite good at sorting out good from the bad and seeing who the uh, competent leaders and competent spokesmen are in, in a, um, uh, a, a large and complex nation state. In the US, um, this is something of an advantage because audiences around the world are used to understanding that the US is many things at the same time. And uh, I think that the US has, a, has more chance to uh, develop a good region, bad nation, good people, or, or good regional, bad national leadership story, or good people, uh, bad administration uh, story uh, than, than some other countries where they're more seen as being just one thing. Uh, the second communication strategy that's come to the fore is the idea that the rival uh, state is, is a failure. And this can be a, uh, a reflex. Uh, sometimes uh, um, uh, spokesmen uh, especially will draw attention to policy missteps of neighbors. And um, what we're seeing is that perception of nation states in the crisis is mapping onto um, uh, ideas about pre-existing problems. So uh, people around the world understand the US as a country with uh, race problems, and so they are looking um, and noticing uh, the racial divide uh, or the way in which the virus plays into the racial divide and racial disparity within the United States. Similarly, China is understood as a totalitarian country uh, with strong central control, and uh, that's one of the first things that international audiences are looking at or, or using as a way into uh, understanding uh, the story um, of China. Uh, China is at a disadvantage here uh, because uh, it was the point of uh, origin of the virus, the country where the virus was first identified, and so Chinese responses are particularly uh, under uh, the microscope. Um, uh, the government has been very sensitive to accusations of failure, um, and uh, I think took particular exception to the cartoon that I have reproduced on this page uh, uh, by a Danish cartoonist of the Danish uh, Danish cartoonist who drew the Chinese flag. Uh, uh, viruses substituting for uh, stars. Uh, there were Chinese diplomats complained about this, uh, but the Danish prime minister uh, informed them that this was a you know a, a, a question of free speech. Uh, nothing that the um, nothing that the Danish government could do about uh, this kind of image. Uh, one of the stories uh, early in the virus that played into American reputation was stories around people buying guns uh, or reacting to the virus by buying guns. This is a story of perpetual fascination for, for foreigners, and it was interesting to see it return uh, during the virus crisis um, uh, as something that people were, were particularly interested in in the United States. On top of these issues of countries highlighting uh, failures and audiences noticing uh, failures of um, significant nation states, we have the problem of deliberate disinformation. Uh, a lot of the disinformation, but not all, uh, is attributed to Russian media. Um, and this is an aspect of the crisis where China, with uh, its uh, state control of media is uh, better insulated than the United States. Uh, but within the United States, there's the problem of a lack of government discipline around information. And unfortunately, one of the largest sources of, or the most prominent sources of confusing information is the president himself. The third strategy I want to highlight for you is the strategy of the gift. Now, 
uh, as a historian of diplomacy, um, I can see the gift working as a strategy right back in human history. I, in fact, I would say that the gift is one of the ancient building blocks of relationships. The first thing you want to do if you want to mark a relationship, uh, build a relationship, is, is give a gift. And there are complex uh, cultural um, uh, factors all around gifts as a whole subfield of anthropology based around uh, the study of gifts. So it's very interesting to see an emphasis on gifts. But as we know, a gift is linked to an obligation. You either uh, give a gift to uh, reciprocate, uh, to show an obligation, but you might also give a gift to establish an obligation to say, I'm giving you this gift, but in the future, you are obliged to me. Uh, I think that we saw gifts used quite effectively early on by South Korea and Japan uh, giving gifts of, of aid to China when the uh, virus first broke out. And what was interesting about these gifts is that they were clearly uh, flagged with little extra cultural layers. So they'd be accompanied or received with a gift of poet with a uh, some poetry or a, or a literary quote or, or something that showed an awareness of a shared culture and that what was going on was about marking something special, something, uh, a pre-existing um, uh, connection, which turned the gift into something natural and special that played to the long-term best aspects of the relationship. And it made it, um, I, I think it opened the door for uh, further positive relations going forward. Uh, China has attempted to use gifts as a way of developing its uh, relationships outside once its own virus was, was under control. Uh, but the Chinese use of gifts has been criticized. And part of the problem has been that Chinese sales for commercial reasons of supplies and Chinese gifts have been uh, conflated. And um, uh, discussion on both sides, both in terms of Chinese embassies presenting sales as gifts and recipients presenting um, uh, presenting sales as gifts has become uh, has complicated uh, the story. Uh, there's certainly been a story about low quality of materials purchased from China, but this comes up uh, from from uh, time to time and is always a problem when you are uh, called on to mass produce at the bottom end of the of the market. The US uh, has also been giving gifts, but this this then gets us to a slightly strange problem. You have to work really hard to find out about the US giving stuff, increasing aid to other countries as a result of the coronavirus. And this seems to be because the Department of State understands that if more Americans knew the United States was helping people around the world, they might not actually be pleased that it could work as, as a negative. The most successful gift diplomacy has actually been from smaller countries, which seem to have less of a vested interest in, um, uh, in sharing resources. Uh, so uh, Taiwan uh, has uh, given a big gift of ventilators to uh, the Czech Republic. And um, uh, this is following on from a, um, a twinning of Prague with Taipei um, and uh, 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 Czechoslovakia, sorry, uh, uh, the Czech Republic becoming caught up in uh, the dispute over the nature of Taiwan and the uh, One China uh, requirement on formal relationships with the People's Republic. Um, but the, my point is that the gifts that Taiwan gave to the Czechs were very much appreciated and. Um, 
increase the reputation of Taiwan in, in the Czech Republic. Similarly, Albania, one of Europe's poorest countries, uh, gave a gift of um, doctors, uh, volunteered to work in the northern part of Italy, uh, to to the to the um, to the Italians, and this was much appreciated. When a poor country gives a gift to a rich country in that rich country's time of crisis, it was um, deeply moving to many Italian people. Uh, fascinating uh, side issue around uh, the gifts uh, has been the way in which some recipients have played off one gift giver against the other and the masters at this were the Serbs who had gifts from China, uh, Russia and the European Union and by being super welcoming to the Chinese and the Russians managed to increase the level of gift that the uh, European Union eventually provided. So well played, Serbia, well played. Uh, I think that gifts so far have not quite been the big factor uh, that some nation states had hoped. The fourth strategy and the one uh, that I feel is the most effective is the partnership. Now, partnerships are still emerging as a source of international reputation. Um, nation states still tend to talk about themselves in terms of what they do unilaterally rather than what they do collaboratively. But we know that as problems transcend uh, boundaries, frontiers, as what Kofi Annan called the problems without passports, um, if problems cross frontiers, easily solutions have to cross frontiers too. And if our single world, our one world, is going to deal with problems like migration, climate, and pandemic, we're going to have to work together. Now, this idea of partnerships being part of national identity is something that comes easily to some countries. Uh, it's um, been a part of how Canadians talk about themselves really since the 1950s. And that uh, fitted with the previous idea of Canada as a partner uh, within uh, the, the British Commonwealth. Um, uh, and Canada, we can see Canada doing very well right now. Uh, there are tremendous positives in affirming partnerships, in doing extra for a partnership at a time of crisis. Uh, Finland has uh, showed how it's increasing aid to the World Health Organization. This means that as the world needs more partnerships, it goes against logic to be identified with attacking partnerships. So I'm particularly concerned by President Trump cutting funding to the World Health Organization and problematizing uh, rulings from the World Health Organization at a time when really we need to trust uh, what they say. I think there are tremendous negatives in unilateralism right now, and this is a time when uh, the world needs uh, participation and needs uh, collaboration from leaders. Um, one of the low points in uh, the image of the United States in Europe in recent months was the story of a President Trump seeking to obtain a monopoly over a vaccine that was being developed by one of the German pharmaceutical companies. Um, this plays very badly for the United States. Uh, the idea of America first was already seen as a, a bad joke, uh, but to actually um, uh, try to uh, monopolize a, a, a vaccine, uh, I, I think is, is misjudging global opinion at this particular moment. I think that both China and the United States have made, made mistakes in terms of partnerships. An example of this would be that uh, neither uh, Trump nor President Xi were involved in the donor conference held in London on um, at the beginning of May. Um, but uh, at least China sent uh, the ambassador to uh, take part uh, in, the, in, in the conference. And uh, the, the recent statement by the foreign minister was, I think, affirming a collaborative approach, uh, whereas the United States has done much less well in endorsing uh, collaboration going forward. So my predictions for national trends. Well, reputations in international affairs change 
very, very slowly. Uh, the big beneficiaries of um, coping well during the crisis are going to be the countries that were already seen as uh, doing well in the world as competent. So South Korea, New Zealand, and Finland, for example, I think will have their reputations considerably enhanced. People were already looking for evidence that these countries knew what they were doing. Uh, I think Taiwan is a special case here. Uh, Taiwan is always working to uh, argue that it's a distinct place separate from mainland China, and uh, the distinct course of Taiwanese public health policy uh, and uh, unilateral Taiwanese medical diplomacy during this crisis has extended the relevance of Taiwan to more people uh, than were thinking about it before the crisis. I think the crisis is giving an opportunity uh, for a certain level of redemption from countries that have been uh, badly thought of in recent years, like Iceland and Greece. Uh, they did poorly in the economic crisis, but they've done well in this crisis, and they're being rehabilitated now in terms of uh, global uh, coverage. But there's a danger for Sweden. Sweden has always been very well thought of, but they seem to have misjudged this crisis with the highest per capita death rate in Europe uh, earlier this week. And uh, this could lead to an adjustment in uh, perceptions of Sweden. The big casualty seems likely to be the United States, but not because of the virus per se, rather because the virus has played directly to existing negatives in American life. Poor health care, genuine inequality between uh, citizens and a deep division between people. Uh, it's like an attack coming uh, in a form that the nation state had not uh, prepared for, like uh, being attacked by a navy when you don't have any ships, uh, being attacked in health when your health care is in disarray and everybody knows that uh, is a disaster for the reputation of the United States. Uh, I think it also hasn't helped that the United States has the largest casualty numbers uh, in the world in absolute terms and uh, has this very unruly public pushing back against uh, rules that people in so many other places in the world have been happy to obey. Uh, it makes Americans, uh, the problem isn't that it makes one American seem like a bad person. The problem is that it makes the whole country seem divided with a large number of unruly and uh, unpublic spirited people, uh, which uh, compares poorly to uh, uh, public behavior in other places. I see uh, this as getting even worse if President Trump should be re-elected uh, in the fall, because then it would really suggest that the problem with America is not the leadership, but with the population itself. Other predictions? It's interesting to see the emergence of exceptions. Um, this business of good places and good leaders, uh, New York State, California, uh, uh, have been seen as responding well uh, to the crisis, uh, and their leaders also. Um, uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo of New York uh, is seen as something of a of a hero in the virus. Uh, similarly, in uh, Tokyo, in Japan, uh, the premier of Tokyo, uh, Yuriko Koiki, um, is very well thought of and seems to be coping very well and leading very well uh, in her municipality. It's been interesting to see how particular um, uh, leadership styles have been um, recognized as, as effective during the virus crisis. One of the most interesting memes going around, which now has supporting journalism, uh, is the idea that uh, the virus has shown the strength of women's leadership and that the countries that have done best in the crisis are led uh, by women. Uh, maybe this is an indication of leadership going forward. It's been interesting to see how some experts have been uh, recognized even outside their own country. Many people around the world admire Dr. Fauci, even as they um, are critical of the man he's working for. Uh, in terms of reputation, of course, there's a big reputational vacancy for whichever country or group of countries 
develops a, vir a, a cure for the virus or develops an effective vaccine. That would be a tremendous uh, claim to, to make. Uh, reputation is based on relevance. You want your country to be excellent in a dimension that is relevant to a population and uh, curing the virus, developing a vaccine, that will be very relevant to audiences around the world. In conclusion, what I see now is international reputations rather like a race that's running into a tunnel. Uh, we can't see quite where the runners are uh, relative to each other at the moment, but in a, in, in a few months, they're going to come out, they'll be polling, and we will get a sense of how and whether uh, reputations have changed as a result of uh, what's happened so far this year. Going forward, uh, the uh, devices of communication remain highly significant. Uh, it's important to see how countries are talking and framing the crisis. It's important to pay attention to absolute outcomes, how many people have died, what percentage of the population has been sick. It's important to look at what the governments are doing. How are they helping? How are they partnering? Uh, those things are contributing or will contribute to reputations. But let's not forget the importance of ordinary citizens and of the reaction of ordinary citizens to the crisis. I was very struck by Boris Johnson's words at the donor conference, uh, the virtual donor conference held at the beginning of May, where he said that the most urgent need, uh, he called the virus the most urgent shared endeavor of our lifetimes and called on nations to cooperate. It's humanity, he said, against the virus. So this is a moment for cooperation, not for grandstanding, not for being seen as angling for, an, for advantage. And I hope that uh, the great powers will do the right thing and find ways of working together for the benefit of us all. Thank you for your attention. And Nick, thank you. Uh, that was a terrific presentation. We're really uh, delighted to have you with us here. Uh, if I could begin first by reminding everybody, uh, this of course is a USC, US China Institute uh, webinar and our speaker is Professor Nicholas Call. Uh, we've got some questions coming in, uh, but more are welcome, so please, Take advantage of that Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, click on it, and submit your question. We'll try to address them. But let's begin with a few questions, if, if you don't mind, uh, Nick, from me. Uh, the first is, I really feel fortunate because you are not simply an analyst of public diplomacy today, you're a historian. So you have this deep background on how crises have played out in the past. And I was wondering, uh, in looking back, looking at various crises, be they natural disasters, earthquakes, floods, tsunamis, uh, or something like a famine, uh, a, a famine that might have been sparked by a war or by drought or something else. And I was wondering if you could contextualize this, this disease outbreak, that has spread worldwide and had such an impact. And look at how countries coped with crises in the past and how that affected uh, their reputation, how mm -hmm. people saw them. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the, the way that I'm, the, the comparison that I usually make is actually to the way in which responses to the economic and political crisis of the 1930s led to major revisions in international reputations. So I'm coming to think that we have these moments that I call reputational reckoning, where things change and the reaction of well-known states to the change reveals a uh, something maybe unexpected 
in the nature of that country to outsiders, but it's something that insiders were very, very familiar about. And probably the most obvious example of this would be the uh, reaction of France to the crisis in the 1930s that, and, and early 40s. Everybody thought of France as being the world's leading military power. Uh, they assumed France was strong, that France was somehow a fixture in international affairs. Uh, people within France, might have had their doubts about that. Uh, they were aware of very deep uh, political divisions. They were aware of internal problems within French political structures. And, uh, but the, 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 the outside world only really saw this in um, the spring of 1940 when France just collapsed uh, uh, under the uh, attack of, of the Germans, divided. So you had occupied France and um, a collaborationist uh, Vichy regime, and the reputation of France has never been the same again. Now, the damage to France had been going on for many, many years. Really, the country had not recovered properly from the, the First World War, but it hadn't been seen. And so the analogy I would see with that is to the United States today, where the United States has not... Um, or, the, or the problems we see in the United States with this onslaught of the virus, having a terrible health care system, everybody being unhappy with each other, deep political divisions, uh, people mistrusting media, uh, having different levels of government actually bidding against each other for um, supplies. Um, this didn't, didn't happen uh, overnight. This is like um, and a, and a, it's the worst kind of attack for the United States to face because it really goes to the deep-seated problems and accumulated problems within uh, American society. I think whoever had been president, this would have been a, a big problem, uh, but a president who is more closely tied to the most troublesome political aspects of this being somebody who's who's very tied into um, you know uh, uh, should we say currents of anger in American society who's very much a person of division rather than unification uh, makes it a, a, a whole lot worse um, my compare um, but if I could jump back to the the 19. Uh, 40s I mean, and 30s, it was also possible to see countries that responded well, whose reputations were uh, successfully revised during that period, countries where people thought, well, oh, that's actually quite a good country. Um, for example, Finland um, really went up in the uh, opinion of the American public during that period. They saw Finland successfully repaying its war debt and thought, well, those those Finns, they mean business. And Finland hadn't really uh, figured in the American mental landscape up to that point. For the country that I think is doing well out of this, uh, it has to be South Korea. And I think it's really interesting for us to ask, what is it about the South Korean response that's so impressive? Why were they able to do it? And my suggestion there is that it was second time through for them, that they had had uh, SARS and more especially MERS. They'd uh, developed um, strategies for dealing with uh, viral outbreaks. And uh, they also knew how important it was for the government to speak with one voice so that people weren't confused. The United States, it's the mixed blessing of having dodged a bullet uh, five years previously, uh, they weren't ready. And in fact, in California, um, they'd actually wound up uh, stockpiles of medical equipment to save money. So uh, this reveals the true nature of American public life. And what troubles me most about it is the extent to which this goes against what Americans think they are. The idea of a republic where people stand for each other, that they, the, the values of the good of the, uh, the good of the one and the, uh, being linked to the good of the many, uh, that was not the philosophy in the United States in recent years. People thought, why should I pay for the health of my neighbor? Well, pandemic is the reason why you should pay for the health of your neighbor. And other countries had not abandoned those kinds of principles. And so that, this is what I think is, um, is going on and why what's happening is so serious and is going to be so, I predict, is going to be damaging for the uh, um, for 
uh, global perception of the United States going going forward. It, it shows the problem isn't one man. The problem is what he represents in a large number of people, and that's much harder to shake. Well, and this is this gets to a you know a really key point. You you said during the course of your presentation that reputations tend to change very slowly. Yes, oh, they don't. They don't change on a dime. And yet, uh, we see, for example, polling in, in Germany, uh, not tied just specifically to this crisis and the response to it, but to uh, the United States relationship to NATO, the United States relationship to the World Trade Organization, that sort of thing. And I was wondering if you could say something about this. Uh, is the question, the American system, or the question, the American society, how fractured mm -hmm. it is, uh, is the question American competence. Do we just not know what to do? Well, the, the scientific studies of public opinion would, would usually look at a number of categories. And uh, the positive reputation of the United States, or the uh, as it happens to be a middling perception of China. These are based on assessments of numerous things, including leadership, uh, including um, uh, exports, quality of exports, including is, does it have an interesting culture? Uh, and uh, are the people um, nice people? Would you want to go there on holiday? All kinds of elements. And what I would expect is that the reputation of the United States, it, it was already being damaged in terms of perceptions of, of government. It had slipped from being number one to being number 18 um, in, the, in Simon Anholt's uh, index. I would expect that you'll also see perceptions of people slipping uh, and uh, perceptions of, um, of, of policy. Uh, slipping, so it'll become generally less admirable. But I think that uh, reputation of American exports is going to hold. Uh, I also think people will hold fast to American culture. Those kinds of preferences change much more slowly. But one of the weird things about reputation is that completely unrelated weaknesses affect um, wider reputation. That's why uh, if you want to promote a product, you might tie it to something unrelated but still attractive. You get an attractive person to advertise your toothpaste. Uh, uh, attractiveness rubs off and ugliness rubs off too. So it's completely plausible that negative aspects of the United States will rub off onto um, uh, perceptions of unrelated things like uh, American um, uh, American um, uh, holidays or so, or, 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 or so forth. An example of this was, do you remember when Denmark got into problems because of the Danish cartoons? Um, pollsters found that Europeans found the Danish countryside less attractive. <laughs> so it's a completely unrelated thing, but there is this, uh, it's called the halo effect, uh, because usually it goes positively, uh, but it's like a negative of, of uh, that the, the halo the halo effect right it, it, the United States becomes a less attractive yes. uh, destination for tourism uh, American holidays those sorts of those sorts yes, of things that's, that's right that's right. cultural products now I, two quick questions and then we're going to the audience we have a few questions that have come in we have space for more so please if you'd like to raise a question click on the Q and A button and type it in. Uh, Nick, you, you use the term uh, rivals as failures, you know, uh, as a mm -hmm. strategy, right? Sure. Uh, depicting this. Other people, including we have some people in the Q&A section, have raised this question of blame game. Uh, the finger pointing <laughs> yeah. specifically between the United States and China. And so, uh, you know, some of it, of course, after the fact, uh, before the bottom falls out, we have praise for China, but then we have nothing but condemnation, right? That sort of thing. Uh, on the Chinese side, uh, you know, there was uh, openness and uh, not in the early stages, but there was uh, an appreciation, for example, from 
uh, the gifts that you described from South Korea, from Japan, there was unhappiness, some frustration when the United States uh, airlines stopped flying and then President Trump imposed this travel restriction, uh, that sort of thing. So there was that sort of pushback. But once the United States became more vociferous, and by United States, I'm really talking about political leaders, uh, Secretary of State, that sort of thing, became more critical of China. Then you had Chinese leaders, specifically in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, sending signals about, well, perhaps this didn't originate in China. Perhaps it originated in the United States. Stop blaming us. And so can you say a little bit more about uh, this blame game. Does it, uh, does it work for domestic audiences mm-hmm. and does it work for international ones? Well, I, um, I think it, it's, very da- it's a dangerous game to play uh, because it makes collaboration harder. And in fact, um, one of the ways that this was dealt with in the Cold War was, uh, and this is when the Soviet Union uh, regularly blamed the United States for AIDS and claimed it was an American biological weapon. Uh, Gorbachev was confronted with this at a conference and was told, you cannot have both collaboration with the United States and say this about us. And he turned off some big tap in the Kremlin and stopped uh, that rumor circulating and said, look, it's a new day. That's gone away. Now, you know, let's get on with collaborating around uh, beating this, uh, this virus. So I see it as a very negative and a short-sighted thing to do. Uh, I think there's a lot of signaling going on to domestic populations. And part of the problem here is that, uh, you know, on both sides of this relationship, both the uh, Chinese side and the American side, uh, has politicians who need to signal that they are um, uh, being tough to, the, to, the, to their own people. But we also live in a world where we all know what everybody else is doing. So it's more dangerous. These signals are heard, they cross boundaries, and uh, it, it's much more disruptive uh, than it, it um, might otherwise have been. This is one of the uh, penalties of losing the old distinction between a domestic media and an international media. I, I remember as a teenager uh, during the during the Falklands War, old Thatcher could uh, be be uh, all cheering for war and going to fight the fascists in in Argentina at home. And uh, on the international news broadcast, it was all about oh how we were going to pursue a diplomatic solution in the United Nations. And you you can't do that anymore. Everybody hears everything, and I think this is part of the problem. We're still not used to dealing with uh, this kind of. Um, uh, transparency that's possible in the era of social media. Well, and as you say, I mean, the, you know, those days have long since disappeared. Uh, and yeah, but the, are politi- so- the thing is that not every politician has clued into the, the new way of dealing with things, and certainly populations uh, haven't, uh, which well, makes and- it a very unstable moment. Right, and uh, we understand why the politicians have been slow on this front. Uh, because of the, their political power is domestically derived. It, and so that's the audience that's first in their minds, even though, of course, uh, one's relationship abroad can have an impact on what you can deliver domestically. But let me, let me shift, if I could, to another thing that you brought up, uh, the World Health Organization. Oh, yeah. And the, the image of international bodies. You emphasized from beginning to end in your presentation uh, the importance of collaboration and how collaboration is respected. It plays well and it happens to work. Uh, So maybe you could say something about the place of international organizations and strategies of dealing with and representing those bodies. Well, I, um, in, internet or collaborative strategies and partnerships have been um, uh, central to the global response to international problems really since um, the, I think it would be the uh, 
the, the big summit that happened in um, in South Africa uh, in the early 2000s, uh, they came up with a whole idea about collaborative development and uh, and and so um, the world has been orienting around more collaborative approaches really since then and uh, it, it's hard for the United States because it's it's default uh, when Americans talk about anything uh, from the Olympics to World War two is that it's a virtuoso performance and you know the other people are just around to applaud from time to time and um, what we're seeing is the problems are now so large that a collaborative solutions are the only way forward but it's not just about the need to collaborate across international frontiers Kofi Annan used to say that the prob these are problems without passports it's not just about the passport. Also, the problems need different kinds of knowledge. So some problems need local knowledge. Other problems need transnational knowledge. Some problems need uh, commercial or corporate knowledge and corporate resource. Uh, and you know, many problems need all these different kinds of actors to be brought together. Um, and it's hard to collaborate across boundaries. But the boundaries aren't only boundaries of nationality. You also need to collaborate across boundaries of generation, um, uh, boundaries of social class. And this can't happen without people actually uh, paying attention to it and, and treating it as a skill and treating it as something that they need to um, really consider. And that's why um, what I, what I found in my studies of networks is somebody needs to be in charge. You are not going to get a spontaneous network that miraculously works. Somebody has to be in charge. Somebody has to maintain the network. And uh, somebody has to r repair the network when things start to go wrong. Uh, and, you know, even some of the stories we tell in, in international affairs about spontaneity, uh, the moment I'm writing about the anti-apartheid movement, that wouldn't have worked if there hadn't been a special office at the UN uh, and some very dedicated diplomats, mainly from India, uh, making sure that the, that the, the world's response to apartheid was uh, coordinated and that could bring together civil society and money from Eastern Europe and money from uh, Scandinavia and could could get the world working around that particular problem and I, I think whether we're talking about um, the the environment or uh, or health um, the, the you know the the implication is the, is uh, the same well now, looking you... at the 21st century uh, it, it seems logical to me that reputation will shift from the generation of reputation in the 20th century around the virtuoso to generation uh, to the generation of reputation in the 21st century uh, around being a great uh, team player and uh, being able to collaborate and being part of getting things done. And it's only the nature of reputation that we care about the reputations that matter to us personally, right? Yeah. Uh, if, if we, you know, some of the nations in China that have, uh, sorry, the nations of East Asia or the uh, governments in East Asia that have put forward achievements in wonderful things, but that aren't relevant, um, don't get any reputational advance from, uh, from that. If you can talk about how you relate to something people care about broadly, food, for example, or martial arts, or uh, animation, then you can connect. Well, beautiful, as you said... Beautiful it, calligraphy doesn't work as a, as a, as a rallying point for reputation. Uh, it, at least outside the places where yes, that's right. calligraphy that's right. is, is, is so valued. It, yes, it uh, has so, to be, but, it, but it's never going to bring in the, uh, the masses. Right. Well, and you've, you've made the point about uh, reputation is tied to competency, but in areas that people find relevant. And in the 21st century, uh, partly thanks to mass media, social media, this sort of thing, we're hyper-conscious of refugee crises. We're hyper-conscious of famine, uh, the impact of drought. Uh, climate change, those kinds of concerns. 
pollution, as Kofi Annan and, and others have said, you've repeated today, these problems know no borders. Uh, they, they, don't re they, they extend beyond the nation state. Uh, Nick, uh, one of the first questions that came in uh, honed in on your topic of gifts. And as you said, I, it's hard to imagine anything more foundational in East Asia, uh, how in fact diplomatic relationships were tied to uh, you know, symbolic gift giving, the tribute exchanges, mm -hmm. oh, these absolutely. kinds yes. of things. Yes. These kinds of things. And uh, the specific question uh, was whether or not the United States accepted gifts from China. And I would add to that about American gifts in China. And uh, you, know, you, you and your students have looked at some of this, uh, this kind of question, both the act of giving and mm -hmm. what you say about that. You highlighted uh, the problem that the, the State Department finds in talking about gifts from the United States. Well, what I found uh, was interesting is that Chinese municipalities gave gifts to mark existing relationships. So there was a gift, and I'm spacing out on which Chinese province it was, but they have a, their uh, legislature is twinned with the legislature in Utah. So there were gifts there. There were gifts given to Maryland. So the gifts were, were welcomed and were shown as affirming pre-existing uh, relationships. So it was not just uh, a dumping gifts from uh, um, China onto the United States. It was uh, kind of like a sort of surgical re use of gifts uh, quite uh, to, to acknowledge um, the, the existence of bonds. And it was very interesting to see how these were spoken about, that there were special uh, acknowledgement of them on the, the embassy website, uh, Chinese embassy website. Uh, and um, I, I found it just a, uh, just a fascinating uh, process because in a lockdown um, economy, uh, you, you know, the, the uh, mounting some kind of ceremony to mark the arrival of a gift is actually quite a complicated thing. And what they did in Utah with a Chinese uh, immersion classroom, um, uh, making messages uh, to say thank you was was very well done, but also very well, very much appreciated and played exactly into the kind of narrative that China would want to have, see how China is uh, appreciated. So I think that Utah knew what it was doing uh, to to uh, just you know like when you're batting a tennis ball back and forth across the net. They knew what it, what they were doing to keep the game keep the game going and uh, uh, and um, uh, let um, their uh, Chinese uh, partners know that that um, the gift was really appreciated. Well, one of the things that struck me in those early days of the crisis was uh, the sister city relationship yes, that's right. kicked in between uh, the city of Pittsburgh here in the United States and the city of Wuhan. And so that was something, uh, you know, because of, you know, our focus on the U.S.-China relationship, we paid a lot of attention to. But I wasn't, I don't know that that made, uh, you know, why was widely circulated in the United States or in China, uh, mm -hmm. you know, but it did speak to that established relationship and the importance of maintaining those relationships. Well, I think that we should say that both you and I have had personal experience right. of gifts of China, from China. And I'm deeply appreciative for uh, a Chinese educational foundation that I've worked with in the past, uh, making a gift of masks for me and, and my family. And uh, I'll never forget that. You know, and I'm sure that there are lots of other stories like that where there has been uh, generosity at a difficult time it is very, very uh, meaningful. And this is what makes feeling in international relationships. When somebody's there, you remember it. But when they're not there and when they disappoint, you remember that, too. That's right. That, uh, you know, trust is something that has to be constantly nourished and appreciated you know, that, that sort of thing. And as you say, uh, we at the U.S. China Institute, I personally, but also at the Institute, uh, we 
the, the Chinese consulate reached out to us, offered us supplies and things like that, and we encouraged them to instead make uh, a donation to a hospital in need, which they did. And the hospital, I'm sure, will not forget that gift. Uh, you know, the consequences are significant. And this leads, so that question came uh, from a teacher in San Diego. Uh, the next question uh, kind of piggybacks on this topic and uh, wondering whether or not you highlighted in your presentation uh, some country to country exchanges, Albania uh, mm -hmm. coming through. Uh, you know, those kinds of donations in times of need. Uh, the effectiveness of Taiwan's gift, both, you know, the protective devices uh, profoundly needed here in the United States, but also quite publicly, quite publicly delivered. Uh, so we have uh, James Anderson who's asked, can you point to examples here in the United States that even in this midst of finger pointing and you know, true catastrophe, true disaster, uh, better than 100,000 people dead in the United States, uh, what do we see below the headlines? Is there significant collaboration, cooperation going on between either government entities, uh, associations, civic, civil society, or just individuals? Right. Yeah, and and the answer is um, uh, yes. There yes there is, but because it's not newsworthy, it's not being reported. So, for example, um, you know, there's a very interesting uh, um, uh, web page that's come up uh, to make uh, uh, recreational vehicles available to doctors. So, people who have recreational vehicles are donating them to doctors. Or there's a, 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 um, a project that I'm aware of where. Uh, a community in Utah that has a lot of extra baby things has been making them available to a community in um, uh, in, in Arizona that doesn't have access to baby care products or is having problems obtaining uh, uh, diapers. It happens that the community in Utah is Mormon. The community in uh, um, in Phoenix is Jewish. Uh, so it's really interesting to see those kinds of things where people are helping each other, uh, uh, people are, are helping each other out, but that's not making the, the, the headlines because it doesn't conform to the big stories that we already have, that we're already, already looking for. And psychologically, what I think is happening here is massive epidemic, not only of the coronavirus, but of confirmation bias, where people are coming into this looking to have particular narratives uh, confirmed and finding them uh, confirmed, like the the uh, Americans want guns thing. And sure, some Americans did want guns as a result of the epidemic, but it, it isn't a, a particularly significant story in the actual living of the uh, in the actual living of the um, lockdown from from day to day. Yeah, and so uh, you know that's that's looking at uh, within the United States. Uh, cooperation that doesn't make the headlines but mm -hmm. makes a difference in individuals' lives. Uh, can you point to anything between the United States and China where we are collaborating? Uh, that, 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 you know, to tell you the truth, I haven't, I haven't noticed, but I will, uh, I, I will keep a, uh, I will keep a, uh, a lookout, and you know, I'm, I'm sure that there will be. Uh, some things I know that there are, uh, you know, individuals who are, um, are are helping each other out. But it'll be interesting to see um, how how that uh, how that develops. I think China's done a slightly better job at coming in on collaborations. Um, they haven't taken this uh, "we're going to do it by ourselves" attitude of the Russia, Brazil, or the United States. Um, um, okay, uh, President Xi wasn't at the donor conference, but it was scheduled for May the 4th, so he might have had other things on that day. Sure. Uh, you know, um, uh, but the Chinese ambassador came, and subsequently there have been uh, very positive Chinese messages to collaborative uh, efforts. I think that they're aware that they need to be seen to be um, collaborating. But, you know, it's the South Koreans who people want to, 
to here. They're being given the place of honor at these international conferences. The next big one is going to be next month in June. So it'll be really interesting to see how the health summit uh, plays out. That's what I'll be. That's what I'll be tuning into, uh, um, to you know, with finger on the pulse to see how that one goes. Yeah, we have uh, early in the crisis. We did see some scientific collaboration with the publication of the DNA of the disease, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, some exchange there. Now, uh, you know, we get stories about attempted hacking of companies that are trying to create vaccines. Uh, these kinds of things. So the, we're not getting as many of those stories on collaboration, even though uh, is, you know, we are told uh, that it is happening. Now, one of the things uh, that uh, people have brought up is Europe. And you focused in your presentation about uh, you know, Europe had its own problems before this, and uh, this didn't necessarily bring everybody together and get everybody on the same page. But uh, the question is about how Europe will view the United States and how it will view China, and to what extent this changes anything in the relationship, this triangular relationship between the three biggest economies. Well, I think it, it strengthens the position, to be honest, I think it strengthens the position of Europe. And uh, Germany comes out of this very positively. Um, and I, I think that you can see how Germany has managed to pull together. Uh, it's been an amazing um, finale for Merkel's time as uh, chancellor. And um, you can see the advantages of having a scientist as a politician. And to be honest, as I mentioned in my talk, having women as politicians, that the crazy people in this uh, crisis have been male leaders. Uh, probably the craziest is uh, Mr. Lukashenko in, um, in Belarus, who said, not only do you not need to worry about coronavirus, you can cure it if you play with a baby goat. Uh, that's all you need is a little fresh air and uh, playing with a baby goat. And um, so he's being ridiculed by his own people. He's being ridiculed by uh, anybody who's noticed. But it's a, it seems to be a, um, a, a phenomenon that a particular style of leadership is really incompatible with what's needed in, um, in, this, in this kind of uh, situation. Um, so I, I, my, my prediction would be, in terms of region, that this will be good for this will be good for Europe and plays well for Europe. Uh, I also think it plays well for for Canada and for anywhere that is open to collaborative um, uh, leader, co- collaborative uh, and participatory uh, middle power governance. So I, I Canada, South Korea, uh, it's clearly good for New Zealand. Um, uh, I, you know, I'm fascinated to see where it goes from where it goes from there. But I'm waiting for the hard. To be honest, I'm waiting for the hard evidence. Right, We're, and we have to wait, you know, a, a little bit longer. We have uh, seen polls done in the United States vis-a-vis China, but we haven't yet seen the polls outside, yeah. except for this one German. But, poll. Uh, you know, to be clear, I don't expect that this is the breakthrough moment for China. I think both the United States and China will be dented by uh, by this. It's not a breakthrough for China, not a breakthrough for Russia, not a breakthrough for the United States, but for the, uh, should we say, the sober middle. That's right. And as you highlighted, on China's periphery, you have South Korea, you have Taiwan, uh, both of which coped much better than virtually everybody else. Uh, and part of this you know, one of the questions has, you know, is the role of education, the role of a national health system. Uh, Taiwan, of course, had a vice president who was an epidemiologist. That's kind of an ideal, ideal situation uh, for that sort of thing. We have a couple of questions, one about uh, the domestic impact in the United States uh, and the potential ramifications for the election. Uh, you know, to what extent does international reputation matter 
to voters in the United States. Let me ask you to hold on on that question. This is probably the only country where whatever foreigners think matters because Americans all want to do the opposite. So yeah. well, literally the fact that foreigners admired Barack Obama was used as a negative in the run up to his successful election in 2008. So. <laughs> yeah, so so high polling, high yes. polling abroad uh, is not necessarily the way to win hearts at home, perhaps. But no. let me let me move from that uh, to a mechanical kind of question that uh, one of our one of our uh, attendees has raised. How do you know where opinion is in the moment? Uh, you know, what are the tools and Besides scholars such as yourself, and besides foundations, or besides uh, you know public opinion companies and, and research institutions, uh, you certainly, of course, also have intelligence agencies and things like that. Who knows right now what people in these other places think? Well, I mean, this is this is the um, this is the big question, and you know they used to say in old Hollywood, nobody knows nothing. And I think that, that there is some truth to that in um, uh, public opinion. Uh, and it's not, not only is it really hard to judge, um, it's, it's easy to misjudge and to ask a question in a way that will give you a false reading. So I feel the only way to do it is to do it scientifically, to do it consistently over time, and to um, uh, accumulate your results so that you can see when there are uh, when there are changes and this is why I pay so much attention to uh, the Anhalt um, index uh, some people try and do it on the cheap using uh, proxy indicators uh, which might include things like um, uh, you know whether a country is getting mentions in newspapers or winning awards or uh, or whether people are going there on their vacations you know um, th those those are kind of interim um, indicators uh, but uh, and, and then there's also um, uh, software is getting better and better at examining um, discussion online and you can see not only whether something's being talked about but if it's being talked about positively or negatively so you know we get some idea of what's uh, trending worldwide but to me what's really important are the in-depth social science uh, interviews polling and pouring over the numbers when they come back from that. And it takes sort of six months, it's maybe five months after those polls that uh, the re reports are actually published and we can get a sense of uh, the, the, you know, the granularity of uh, international opinion, who's doing, uh, well, you could also ask, you know, do, does, it, um, does it matter? Um, what matters is, people's interior lives, the way in which a successful country or a negatively branded country actually becomes part of how you think about the world. This is like our inner furniture. And uh, if so, you know how you feel weird if somebody moves your furniture. You feel weird if somebody moves uh, one of these countries around in, in, in your mind. It takes a lot of getting used to. And so I, I I, I think that what's happening right now is actually um, uh, is is momentous, uh, and it'll be more momentous if Trump is reelected. And let me let me end with two quick questions that both deserve an hour and a half answer. Uh, so this is really quite unfair. And you've already just told us that we need to have you back in six months. <laughs> uh, the data is in. So we'll, well, one we'll, of the we'll, social we'll, scientists, you need to have one of the, you know, somebody from Pew or... Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll bring... We'll, Ipsos. We'll, or maybe bring, a panel of Pew, in. Ipsos, and so, and so. Uh, but, but real quick, and we only have a couple of minutes. So uh, if you can assess the relative roles of mass communication in the sense of the more traditional media, even if it's on the internet, uh, newspapers, magazines, uh, you know, television programs, those sorts of things, and contrast that with uh, the social media revolution and the relative importance of these two 
to this question. So that's question one. Question two is, how about humor? How about humor? How does humor play into this? Uh, you know, the, the kinds of, you know, in the United States, we've got all kinds of jokes and cartoons and memes about this. In China, there was an explosion of jokes, uh, tales being told, right, uh, about these sorts of things. One of my favorite uh, Chinese jokes involved uh, a, a Beijing uh, roast duck restaurant, and they talked about no customers and no dead ducks, right? That was... <laughs> You know, and they, what they were playing on was the daily statistical indicators, that sort of thing. And so the place of humor in this. Well, I can take the place of humor first and uh, say when I was talking about the idea that you could have a, a negative portrayal of a government, but a positive portrayal of a public, humor is one of the ways of getting to that resilience of the public. And I think the compilations of Chinese TikTok uh, that have been circulating have really uh, made people feel very warmly towards ordinary Chinese people. Uh, and and similar, similarly, you know, the, the, the jokiness uh, that came out of Italy, people singing to each other, uh, I mean, all those sorts of things, you know, that will be remembered as one of the uh, positive aspects of the virus and part of the way in which people are kind of claiming the experience uh, for themselves. And it may be uh, that we, we will see, uh, you know, in, 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 in Britain, uh, it wasn't only uh, examples of humor, some at the expense of the government, but also um, spontaneous appreciation for uh, public for the public uh, uh, health service uh, going out and uh, uh, one hour or you know particular time in the week and banging your your lids together to make a noise to support the national health service or an old war hero became very famous very quickly a hundred years old because he raised money for uh, for the for the health service so folk heroes are part of this story too in terms of how this is impacting on on media, uh, clearly it's one of those moments where you realize the extent to which we're involved in social media, how newspapers have uh, retreated in, in significance and the damage, to be honest, the damage that that has done because people are going to websites and going, uh, quoting stuff on social media without really getting into the um, uh, authority of the material they need. And I think that a pandemic is one of the moments where you need something that has the stamp of truth. Uh, a scholar who's working on this problem has coined the term uh, informational distancing. And I think that's a very helpful term that just as we need to maintain distance from people in our neighborhood, we need to maintain distance from uh, information that comes into our social media feed until we know whether it's accurate or not. Be careful what you pass on, virally and informationally too. And I suspect that this is part of a process of learning to deal with uh, the mass media uh, in, in the age of uh, social media. And, you know, if it's all it takes is a virus to come to terms with the media, I'd be, I'd be quite uh, relieved because coming to terms with the popular press took the First World War. Coming to terms with the uh, newsreel uh, and radio right. took, the, yeah. took the Second World War. Coming to terms with TV uh, took some of the great political swings of the Cold War era. So if, if all this takes to sober up to the need to treat material online um, uh, properly is uh, a pan is a, uh, a, a pandemic, we may well have escaped lightly. Well, when, quite frankly, the spread of a disease is very much tied uh, to whether or not you listen and assess, uh, you know, the validity. Where does this come from? Where, you know, it, it should make reliable sources so much more important. Uh, that right. and, and in some ways it has the BBC, <laughs> sorry, as a British person, I can report that the BBC has unprecedented international listening figures because, you know, people are realizing that, you know, when push comes to shove, you want to listen to somebody who has a reputation for getting the story right. Well, uh, here at the USC, US-China Institute, <laughs> we really welcome the, 
the participation of British nationals and the BBT. <laughs> Nick, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thanks. You're very welcome. Well, and, and thanks to uh, this very large and active audience. We really do appreciate the way that people have tuned in, the way they've told others about these programs, and your participation uh, via the questions that you ask. You are part of these programs. So thanks to everybody who is here. And we look forward to having you with us again uh, very soon.